We're going to talk today about Hume. Hume answers one of the fundamental questions that we're trying to ask in this class. The question for weeks two, three, and four is, who am I? And Hume gives his own account of who we are, what the self is. So I want to go over briefly some of his main arguments. Hume is concerned with the idea of the self. So he's not concerned just with who the self is, but our idea of the self. Okay? And for Hume, we can't actually have an idea of the self unless we have an impression of the self. And so for Hume, there's this distinction between the self, our impressions, which for him is plural, of the self, and then our actual idea of the self. Okay? Let's talk a little bit about his rhetorical style. Hume's rhetorical style is to anticipate counterarguments. So he begins the very first uh, paragraph of his text in actually putting forth what other philosophers have said. Right? So he starts his, his argument with, quote, There are some philosophers who imagine we are every moment intimately conscious of what we call our self that we feel its existence and its continuance in existence and are certain beyond the evidence of a demonstration both of its perfect identity and simplicity. Right? Both of its perfect identity and simplicity. What does he mean by that? That we actually think that we understand the self, that we have a very um, actually simple idea of what the self is. We don't actually think of it as that complicated, we don't think it's difficult to access. Um, we actually imagine that we have a very good idea of the self, that we have access to the self, and that it isn't really that difficult uh, maybe to figure out what the self is. Now, he's writing this in response to previous works by previous philosophers. And in fact, all philosophy is a dialogue with the past. So someone like Hume would have read Descartes and would have been concerned with Descartes' whole analysis of the self, whether or not it's possible to know the self, right? And so he would have been writing in response to someone like Descartes. And so when he says some philosophers, he probably means Descartes, he might mean some others, but he definitely is referring to Descartes, right? So he talks about this counter-argument, but then he presents his own argument, which is that, you know, these philosophers are all wrong, right? So we imagine we are intimately conscious of what we call the self, right? This is paragraph one, page 48. This is what others say. But what he actually argues is that we have no idea of the self. Right? And throughout the text, he lays out his argument. So he starts with the counter-argument. Then he says, no, that's not true. And then he proceeds to spend a good portion of his text explaining what is wrong with the argument that others make. Right? People who think we have an idea about the self are wrong. And then he tells us how they're wrong, right? In essence, he's telling the reader how the reader is wrong because most people reading this text are going to walk into this with the assumption that they do have an idea of the self, right? You probably imagine that you have an idea of the self. And so you probably start off disagreeing with Hume. You may even end up disagreeing with Hume. But he actually takes you on. So I want you to read the text in that light. See it as Hume taking on this argument that we have we are intimately conscious, intimately conscious, right? We know very well what the self is, right? And that we are, he said we are always aware of the self. And this is wrong, according to Hume, right? So what is the essence of his main argument, right? His main argument it has, you know, about, I would say, three main premises, right? One is that, you know, his main argument is we have no idea of the self, and the premises provide us some, some reasons for why we have no idea of the self, right? One of the first ones, ideas must begin in impressions, all right? So for Hume, we can't just have an idea of something without first having an impression of it, right? And this is a particular school of thought within philosophy, empiricism, um, which empiricists believe that all of our knowledge comes from our sense perceptions, right? So we either see it, we feel, you know, we, we, we sense it in some way, we see it, we hear it, we touch it, right? And that all of our data comes from these sense perceptions. And so for someone like Hume, who is an empiricist, we would have to have impressions before we could have ideas about anything, right? All of our ideas, all of our knowledge must be based on these impressions, Right? So for Hume, in order for us to have an idea of the self, we must have impressions of the self. And so that's where his argument begins. 
Ideas must begin impressions, right? And then according to Hume, we have no single impression, right? Right? We have no single impression. Because what Hume explains is that we have several impressions, right? We have what he calls a diversity of impressions. But we don't have any single, simple impression of the self, right? So for Hume, look at this picture up here. We have these impressions. You can see these little circles. You can think of them as representative of, you know, our impressions, right? So right now, you know, at this moment today, I have this impression of this whiteboard, right? And I have an impression of myself writing on the whiteboard, you know? But, you know, just five minutes ago, I had a different impression of myself turning on my camera, right? Or writing on this board, you know, something different. And so, for Hume, we have all of these different little moments, right? We have impressions of ourselves, and they're just these moments, right? And he calls these a diversity of impressions. He says we have all of these distinct impressions, right? And that we, we confuse this diversity of impressions with what he calls an identity of impressions. So this is where we take, we take you know, this line and we kind of blank together all of these impressions and then we call that our identity. We say, well, the impression I had of myself five minutes ago and the impression I had of myself an hour ago and the impression I had of myself when I was five and the impression I had of myself when I was ten, that we can link all of these impressions together and they're actually all parts of a whole which I call myself. Right? But Hume says actually these are two very distinct phenomena, that there's a diversity of impressions you know, is not the same as an identity of impressions, and that we're confusing one for the other, right? So he says we confuse identity with diversity, right? And that is how we come up with this fallacious conclusion that we have an idea of the self, right? And that's, in essence, Hume's main argument, right, in a nutshell. Now, of course, he elaborates, right? He gives many arguments by analogy and arguments by example. And so I wanted to highlight a couple of those, right? He makes a number of arguments by analogy. You can think of them as arguments by example, too. Now, when you read Weston, you're going to become familiar with these argument types, right? So arguments by analogy seek to explain one thing that you're unfamiliar with in terms of another thing that you're more familiar with, right? Argument by example gives you examples which support your claim. Right? So Hume gives an, gives an argument by example of an object. But it's actually also an argument by analogy because he wants you to think of it as an analogy to the self. But you don't have to to understand that particular sub-argument. You can just look at the argument about the object. So we're going to turn to that argument next, that sub-argument about the nature of objects. But I wanted to point out to you that he has a number of arguments by example and analogy in the text that you want to pay attention to. On page 51, there's a reference to noise, how we understand noise. Then there's the argument about the church, the argument about the river. On page 50, there's an argument about how we understand the identity of plants and animals. And there's also a reference to a theater. Okay? So pay close attention to those sub-arguments because they help you to understand this larger argument in which he tries to distinguish Identity from diversity, right? A, you know, a series of impressions from an identity of impressions. Okay.